Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smith, your favorite English teacher down in the blue hallway. Today we're gonna to talk about the reading portion of the ACT. More specifically, we're gonna talk about the nonfiction reading portion of the ACT. When you get your reading test in front of you, it's always going to be the third test you'll take on the ACT. You're gonna see your first passage. Now, the funny thing about this first passage is I don't want you to answer the first passage questions now. That first passage is prose fiction or a literary narrative. We're not going to worry about that one right now because there's only going to be one passage on that entire reading section that focuses on literary narrative or prose fiction, if you will. We don't want to worry about that because the other three passages are all nonfiction. We want to focus our attention on 75% of that test instead of on 25% of that test. If we can cover the 75% figure out a strategy that gives us enough time to get through all the questions effectively, then we can go back and spend time on the other 25% of the test. So let's talk about how we do that. First and foremost, we don't have time to sit down and read four passages on the ACT reading section. We, we can't give that much time to reading. Yes, it's a reading test. Yes, there are four passages. But you only have 35 minutes to do it. And that's a problem, because if you sit there and try to read everything, you're going to run out of time when you need to be answering questions. You don't get points for reading everything. You don't get points for reading very well. You get points for answering the questions correctly. So what we need to do is figure out how to answer the questions as quickly as possible. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to use the structure of the passage against itself. You've learned a lot about writing over the years. It's time to put that into use with this reading test. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Every one of these passages is gonna start with an introductory paragraph. Now, you don't need to read the whole thing. Let me show you what you need to get out of this paragraph because it's not a lot. First thing you wanna find is the thesis or sometimes it may just be a main idea. We know that that's usually going to be the second or third sentence in that passage or in that paragraph. So we don't want to read too far in. We just want to find it. Once we find it, circle it. The other thing you want to read in there is the transition sentence at the end of that, pa of that paragraph to let you know where this passage is going. Other information you need to find in the first paragraph are numbers and capital letters. Numbers because those are going to be dates. Capital letters because those are going to be proper nouns or the people, places, things, big events that you're gonna to wanna to find. If you just circle those wherever you find them, that way they're easier to find later. Okay, now we've gotta talk about the other paragraphs. We've got body paragraphs. We've got a lot of them. There's probably gonna be five to six on any one of these tests. You'll also have a conclusion. Let's talk about the body paragraphs. Okay, we can't give time to read all of this. So we've got to come up with a way that we only read what we, what we need in here. So what you wanna do for these paragraphs is you want to be able to answer one question. And that question is, what is in the paragraph? I wanna write that down because that needs to guide us. What is in the paragraph. So all you need to read is enough to answer the question, what is in the paragraph? So what do you need to read? Enough. That's it. Just read enough. And I know that sounds very nonspecific, but let me explain what I'm talking about. If this passage is about Amelia Earhart, which sounds fascinating, trust me, I'd love to read the whole thing, but we don't have time. If this passage is about Amelia Earhart, I'll know that it's about Amelia Earhart from what I read up here. But if this passage starts talking about her childhood, or it talks about when and where she was born, I already know this is about her early life. And so all I have to do is just write out to the side, early life, uh, a, a one word or two word phrase, something to help you remember what's here is all we really need. And I'll explain why in a minute. As we move on, the next paragraph about Amelia Earhart talks about how she got interested in flying and how she learned to fly. So I may just put here, training. 
very simply training. This is how she learned how to fly. This is how she became interested in flying. It's how she became good at flying. And then down here in this paragraph, this may start talking about her major accomplishments. And so if it talks about her first uh, solo flight or the transatlantic flight or any of these things, these are just her major accomplishments. We'll write major accomplishments. And in this next paragraph, down here, it talks about how she died. Well, simply, what's in the paragraph? This is about her death. And that's what I mean by finding enough. This is a conclusion paragraph. Any good writing teacher will tell you that your conclusion paragraph is pretty much the same thing as your introduction paragraph. Don't read it. Just skip it. Just skip that. So what we've been able to do by reading a very small amount is getting as enough information to move on to the questions. Because here, we've reduced reading down to about 40%. If you're only reading 40% of this passage, you've got a lot of time left over to answer questions. Now, this process here, this process here, you want this to take about a minute and 30 seconds. That's your goal. Now, goals are great, but there's something you have to work toward. The first time you do this, you're probably not going to hit a minute and 30 seconds. That's okay. Even if you get within 30 seconds, 45 seconds, you're doing really well. So you want to start off with a goal of getting this done in a minute and 30 seconds. Then you got to move on to questions. Now here's the thing about the questions. I'm going to tell you a little story. When I was younger, when I was a boy, my mom used to make me go to the grocery store with her. It was not my idea of a good time because my mom she really liked to go up and down every aisle. And I used to say, Mom, why, why do we go up and down every aisle? She said, Sean, we, I gotta see if there's anything we need on these aisles. And I didn't understand because I was young, but when I got older and I learned how to read, I realized at the end of each aisle, there's a big sign that told you what was in the aisle. And I realized that we could have saved a lot of time if we looked up at that sign and said, oh, this aisle's only got bathroom stuff in it. We don't need any bathroom stuff. We're gonna skip this aisle and move on. All you're really doing is setting up these signs at the end of each aisle so when you get to the questions, you know where to go very quickly to find your answers. So let's talk about the questions. There's gonna be two types of questions for these passages. The first type of questions are questions where you can find the answer. And all you really have to do to find the answer is read the question and it should give you a pretty good idea of where you need to go in the passage to find the answer. If you've got a question about Amelia Earhart's accomplishments, we know really quickly we need to go straight here. We're not wasting our time because time is our most precious resource on this test going back and looking in the intro and going and looking in her early life or her training. We can just zip straight to major accomplishments Within there, you're looking at five sentences. Surely you can find the answer very quickly. Most of your questions will be find the answer questions. So as long as we're taking our time in making this road map, we'll call it, or putting the signs at the end of the aisle at the grocery store, we can very quickly find about seven of our questions answers really quickly and easily. The other type of question, the questions where you can't really just find the answer, we're gonna call these elimination questions. And I'm going to take a minute to make sure I'm spelling this right. There we go. So elimination questions are a little bit different. With elimination questions, and if you haven't taken a lot of practice tests, this won't really make a lot of sense. But when you get to a question and you go, I can't find the answer, what you can find is wrong answers. And you can find them pretty easily because if you've already been familiar enough with this, you know a lot about what's going on already. But a couple of those answers are going to jump out as clearly wrong. Cross those answers out. Between the last two answers that are available, you know one of them is right. So you have the option to, depending on how much time you have left, take an educated guess. You have a one in two chance of getting it right. Or narrow it down enough that you can actually find the answer based on what's left and what's in the passage. So that's the other type of question. That's how you get those taken care of. The problem you're going to run into is time. So we talked about how we would take a minute and 30 seconds as a goal for the skimming and annotating part of this test. For answering the questions on each one of these passages, you're going to attempt to do it in five minutes and 30 seconds. 
five minutes and 30 seconds, it's, it's not a frenzied pace, but the fact that you know where you need to go quickly should reduce a lot of the time you're spending looking for the right place and help you zero in on the answer, or at least where you can find the answer, very quickly. So what you want to do when you sit down to take a practice test is you want to, at the top of your paper, write a minute 30 with a slash and five minutes and 30 seconds with a slash. And then read and take your test with a timer. You have a timer on your phone. You probably want to put it on airplane mode if you're in school. Even if you're at home, make sure you turn your notifications off because you can't be distracted. You can see with a minute and a half and five and a half minutes, you don't have time to be distracted. And when you're taking the test on ACT day, you won't have a phone with you at all. So what we're trying to do is get used to the timing. So you're setting a goal of a minute 30. So as you start your timer, very quickly go through, skim, and annotate for the things that we discussed here. When you're done, stop your timer. Write down the time it took you. It may take you longer than a minute and a half the first time, that's okay. You may never get it down to a minute and a half, but if we're aware that we need to bring our time down, we're constantly working. And the more you practice this, the more familiar you become with this strategy, your times will start to come down. Five and a half minutes, on the other hand, we're gonna do the same thing. I say just stop your timer, reset your timer, take a deep breath, and when you're ready to start answering the questions, start your timer again. When you're finished, and I don't mean when you're finished and you've checked over every answer and you've made sure they're all exactly as correct as possible. I mean when you're done with 10 questions, stop your timer. Write down your time. Okay? Then you kind of have an idea of where you are. With these times, two and a half minutes, six minutes, and 37 seconds, that's nine minutes and seven seconds. And while that's not necessarily ideal, it's pretty good. That's a great place to start and start bringing your time down. If you can get your time down to seven minutes, you're looking at 21 minutes for 75% of the test. If you can do that, you leave yourself with 14 minutes for the other 25%, which is the literary narrative or the prose fiction section, which we'll talk about later. Uh, when I teach this in my classes, we're practicing this with 11 minutes because seven for all of these is an ideal world. The main thing is you want to spend your time early on these nonfiction passages so you can maximize your scoring potential. If we get down and we have less time on the narrative or the literary narrative section, it's okay because we've already maximized our time on this larger part of the test. So even if you take eight minutes on every one of these and you have 24 minutes total, for the nonfiction section, you end up with 11 minutes, which is what we're practicing with in my classes, for prose fiction. And that should give you plenty of time to take care of what you need to take care of on the prose fiction section. The main thing is, when you sit down for the ACT on test day, you need to be as familiar with what the test looks like, how the test is made up, the types of things they're looking for, and have a, a really good strategy for approaching it. That's going to put you miles ahead of a lot of other people taking the test who've never seen it before and have no idea what's going on. But the more you practice this, the quicker you get your times down, the closer you get your times to seven minutes on each one of these passages, the better off you're going to be overall on the test and the higher your score will soar. I'm Mr. Smith, and that's nonfiction reading on the ACT.